human beings in the march of progress began to explore and examine the universe and its laws of nature, they discovered that matter and energy are ultimately really not two forces but one force. So the classic E equals MC squared of Einstein, the theory of relativity, where energy equals matter, and matter basically equals energy. And they're just two forms of one entity is something that really captures in essence the whole, uh, you could say the soul of science. Just to put it in very specific terms, let's just use communications as an example. In simple terms, communications essentially, all our communication devices, beginning from the, first the telegraph, then the telephone, then radio and television, and now the internet and mobile, and cellular technology, really all essentially um, eliminates and erases the separation of time and space, basically that was always a fundamental component to the material world. Physical world occupies space. You live in one place, there's no way for you to connect to another place, either by, or, uh, the only way to get there is through travel, which can take time, which takes a lot of time, um, communications, technologies learn to bridge the gap between time and space by discovering forces that are invisible to the naked eye, whether airwaves, sound waves, light waves, that now we can actually tap into these waves and communicate both audio and visually instantaneously across the globe. So essentially it wiped out, and melted away, it eliminated the distinction that space meant that you couldn't go there quickly. Now, yes, physically you can't be there, but you can communicate with it very quickly, instantaneously. Faster than it takes you to walk across the street, you can speak to somebody on Skype in Australia. So, just what does this really mean? That means that matter, that was always perceived as being a block, an obstacle to connecting, is not an obstacle because there's something beneath the surface called energy. Take, for example, conductivity, to conduct electricity, or to conduct any type of energy. So there are conductors. What's a conductor? A conductor is a piece of matter that's very conducive to conduct any, a form of electricity or a form of energy. There, there are objects in the world that are not, and there are objects in the world. Copper, for example, is a great conductor. Silver is not. So it essentially shows us that matter and energy are getting closer and closer. So where once we saw the world as being, here's a physical universe, and maybe there were some energies here and there, today we see the opposite. Everything is energy, and the only thing is the naked eye only relates to the matter. So t today we understand that the building blocks of both the human life, the DNA, and the building blocks of the general world, which is the subatomic energy and, the, and subatomic particles, are invisible forces, they're energy, that when they're combined in the right way, they create what we call matter. But when you look at any piece of matter, whether it's a piece of wood, or it's a piece of metal, or anything in this world, it all really is different types of energies. Everything is made up of certain um, elements. Those elements are made up of different molecular structures, which in turn are a combination of atoms, which in turn are made up of subatomic particles. And as deep as we go, it ultimately comes down that energy in the right configuration creates different forms of matter. So matter is energy, essentially. Different combinations of energy create different types of matter. And the more science, the more, the greater the scientific progress, the greater the breakthrough, the more the distinction between matter and energy becomes less and less. Where today we could technically manipulate a certain thing on the energy level and it can change the properties on the matter level. That's how close it's become. So, in truth, according to this type of physics, there is no duality. Matter equals energy. It just appears to be two different realities. And the same, is, the same question always was raised also in context of our personal lives. Because you can ask also the same question about us. We know that we have a bundle of different forces and voices that shape our psyches. There's no one here, there's no one on earth that doesn't struggle with some things. We have the struggle between our mind and our heart. We have struggled between different interests, self-interest, the bigger good, what we know is right, and, we, and sometimes the reality is on the ground.
And if you think about it, you could say I, most people's lives are pretty fragmented between the different things that we're occupied with. If you were to make a list of everything you did today, you'll come up with approximately 100, 150 items. And most of them have no connection one to the next. You woke up in the morning, you had a coffee, you showered, you exercised, showered, you dressed, you commuted, went to work, a coffee break, a tea break, a meeting, a whole bunch of random items. Most of them have not, most, some of them are completely uh, menial. Some are just means to another end. And essentially you have a whole list of things. If you were to try to create a thread between a few of the items, you would find very few threads connect them all. What connections does it have the commute you had in the morning with you sitting here right now, for example? So what we, and basically is that our days are filled with a whole bunch of fragments. A multiplicity, not just duality. And the question is, is that really our destiny? Are we doomed to a life that is fragmented? With moments of respite and moments of... Uh, Moments where we feel a little calm, or, but generally speaking, a, whole, a bundle of different forces tugging at us in all different directions, which is often how we feel, and the anxiety and the tension that that brings, and it accumulates day after day, year after year. And we try to find compartments, we compartmentalize, try to find compartments where we can find some, as I said, some solace. But to say that we live a seamless life, where everything you do is part of one bigger picture, most of us cannot really make that statement. So the question is, Is this what is reality? Is the universe a world of duality and multiplicity, or is it a world of unity? Is it seamless, or is it fragmented? And of course, this applies both on a scientific level, on a philosophical level, and on a psychological level. This question is a, is, is a major question that has plagued thinkers from the beginning of time. And there are all kinds of schools of thought about this. And... This essentially is the theme of this week's uh, Torah chapter. So you have the story where Moses, on the way to the promised land, tells and appoints 12 men who are the heads, the, the leaders of their communities, each of the leader of their particular tribe. So the greatest men of the time. And he chooses them to go and be scouts, to check out, spy out the land to go to the promised land, to Israel, and look around, to see, as the Ramban says, to figure out what's the best way to conquer the land. You know, Before you go into land, you want to know what's the easiest way, where are the valleys, where are the mountains, where are the enemies, just to get a sense of the lay of the land. And the scouts go, as Moses directed them, and they come back. However, they come back with a very terrible report. They say, we scouted out this land, and it's a land of giants. It's a land, as they memorably, in their memorable words, they say, a land that consumes its inhabitants. Eretz Echeles Yishver. It's too powerful for us. We cannot conquer it. And they basically create panic among the Jewish people. So instead of this excitement that they had, they left Egypt on their way to Sinai, to the promised land, now, the entire nation began to weep, saying, why did you bring us here? They began complaining to Moses, to Aaron, why did God take us out of Egypt just to bring us to a world, to a, to a country that, we, that is going to consume us and will annihilate us? As a result of this weeping, this was the night of Tisha B'Av, actually. This is the first time Tisha B'Av is documented. The first sad, the saddest day in the Jewish calendar, the first event is this bad report. And God said, if you're going to cry, I'll give you something to cry about. You don't want to go into the land? Fine. None of you will end up in this land. And at that point, it was decreed that every Jew who weeped that night would die in the, in, the, in the wilderness exactly as they wished. They didn't want to go. So you'll stay here. You bring upon yourself what you had wished for yourself. And it would only be their children that would enter the promised land. Only two men, two individuals would enter the Israel. That would be Joshua and Caleb, Kolov. These were two of the 12 scouts. But these, was, these two were different than the other 10 because they stood up against them and said, no, it's a beautiful land. That is Tev Ma'id, Ma'id. Very, very beautiful. Very special. And we could conquer it. But they were outnumbered. So because they were the only ones that gave that report, Joshua and Caleb, they would be the only two that would actually enter the Israel. Everyone else would die in the wilderness. 
And this becomes the first, as I said, of other sad events that happened that night. The destruction of the temple. The first temple. The second temple. And other terrible events. The Talmud, the Mishnah documents five serious events that happened. But more things happened on Tisha B'Av. The expulsion of the Jews in 1492 from Spain was on Tisha B'Av. World War I began on Tisha B'Av. So you see, this day that was first documented here in this week's chapter became a day that throughout history remained a sad day and the saddest day in our calendar. So clearly what the scouts stated was not a small matter. It wasn't some incidental statement. It's a relevant statement. What was their problem? They had heard the promise. They had all seen miracles. They had all seen that God can take them out of Egypt. Why can't God lead them into the promised land? They all knew it was a holy land. They knew God had promised them. What suddenly bothered them? And these were not small people. It says, It says, at that moment when Moses sent them, they were holy, they were kosher. And they were leaders. What was it that they saw that suddenly disturbed their faith? And that they felt they cannot conquer a land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Every, all the Jewish people knew that the whole point of the whole, the whole journey was to return to Israel. When Jacob had to leave Israel because of the great famine. Hundreds of years earlier, everyone knew. That he's leaving only on condition to return one day. The question was when. And now they had finally left Egypt. They received the Torah. They saw so many miracles. Suddenly they got cold feet. How, what happened exactly? What did the scouts... What, did, what troubled them? And how were they able to so easily persuade the people that there's a big problem here? The answer to that is what bothered them was what I was addressing before. You see... It's one thing to read about things in a book. It's another to implement them. When they saw the land with their own eyes, they suddenly realized the great challenge here. In the wilderness, even though it was a wilderness, it was not a place of civilization, but they were surrounded by, they were protected. They were protected by the clouds of glory. They had water from Be'er Shamirim, water from the stone. And they had the food, the man, the Lechem and Hashemayim. They basically were being provided for from heaven. God protected them. One of the reasons we sit in a sukkah, in the holiday of Sukkot, after Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, because it reminds us of the clouds of glory that surrounded them. So they were essentially in a very spiritual state. They had also just received the Torah. Remember when the scouts left, it was right after they had received the Torah, not much later. The decree that there would be 40 years wandering in the wilderness came after the scouts. So they just received the Torah. So they were basking in very profound spiritual light. And suddenly they saw a material world. After these years, they saw a material world. They were frightened. Philosophically, they felt it's impossible for us to enter this land. It's impossible for us to integrate spirit and matter. Energy and matter. So there was the first dilemma, long before science. Long before philosophers, long before anyone, the scouts were bothered by this issue. And that's the words they used. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. If we want to remain, retain our spiritual integrity, we have to remain on an energy level, on a spiritual oasis, which is the wilderness, where we're protected. It's like being inside your mother's womb, or living in a kolel, surrounded by holiness. To enter a real the marketplace, the real world... It's too powerful. There's no way we can, we, can we can integrate that into our own life without compromising our spiritual integrity. So it's actually their greatness was their undoing. Because they were so spiritual, that's why they felt so threatened by this material world. And this has been the dilemma throughout history. Can these two worlds meet? Can we integrate two realities in our lives? Or do we have to f compartmentalize? And the scouts decided to choose the spiritual path. And it was easy for them to persuade the Jews precisely because the Jews were on a loftier level. This wasn't suddenly losing, getting cold feet. On the contrary, they wanted to remain in a spiritual state of affairs. Why, need to, why the need to enter into the challenge of having to go to war and the day-to-day the -day struggle with material life? So imagine you had the two options. Okay? You're growing up as a child. Into a, from a child into an adult. And for the first time, you're sent to scout out the land. And you look at the real world. It's not the world inside your home. 
let's assume you have a healthy home, a nurturing environment, a very spiritual environment. And suddenly the first time you're told, go out there and check it out. You go onto the streets of Manhattan. You go to the financial markets. You start seeing how people treat each other. You start saying, hey, this is a different type of world than the spiritual environment that I'm accustomed to. This is a world where dog eats dog, survival of the fittest, people backstab each other, they lie, they're duplicitous, best friends can kill each other over a few dollars. I mean, it's a world that is not exactly uh, optimal. It's a duplicitous world. It's a world where people lie, where people cheat. Yeah, not everything is bad. But it's possible. It's, it's potentially bad. So you run back for the to, for the life of you. You go back and say, why do I? Why would I want to go out into this cruel wilderness, into this cruel world? I could stay in an environment that is holy. But nevertheless, that's exactly the purpose of existence. God did not want to uh, remain in a spiritual environment. He challenged us to go into a world where it is difficult, where it is selfish and cruel, where it's cold and dark. And the goal being for us to warm it up and to illuminate this world. That's the purpose of existence. So the Miraglim, the scouts, essentially captured the dilemma that anyone would have. Anyone. Why would I want to go into such a place? And the thing, the interesting thing is, it's not just the going into a place and coming out unscathed, but you have the power to transform the world that seems so uh, foreign and alien to anything that's spiritual. The question, however, is how? How is this possible? Logically, it makes much more sense what the scout said. It makes much more sense to remain on the mountain or to remain in a spiritual environment rather than to have to deal with the challenges of life. How can we, how can we reconcile the two? And this is where Ayan Bayes um, has its own particular take where he gathers together and in a way he accumulates the ideas from Hasidic and Kabbalistic thought on the subject, which address much more fundamental issues than just the fear of a cruel world. The bigger question, of course, is that when you're basking in the glow of uh, of, uh, spiritual energy, um, anything that's not of that nature seems antithetical. But the question also goes deeper because the real question is how can the finite meet the infinite? Not just mathematically, but spiritually, psychologically. How can we really connect to immortality when we're mortal human beings? And every person dies, and we all go through the aging process, and we all go through our changes. And yet, the Torah tells us, that when you cleave, cling to me, to the divine, you have the power to achieve immortality. You look at the Jewish people as a whole, though the fewest among nations, has gone through more persecution and murders and expulsions than anyone for thousands of years did not have a country or land or nation or empire or an army of its own. And yet we're still here. So what is the secret of such survival? When any Jewish leaders meet the Dalai Lama, the first question he asks them all is, what is the secret of Jewish survival? How is it that without a land without a country, without a centralized power, we are able to make it through. Now he's also asking for personal reasons, because he has been exiled from Tibet, and trying to maintain Tibetan Buddhism in a way that can survive at all. So he's trying to find out what the secret is. And in his mind, it's clear that in a few years, if you don't have a country and you don't have a centralized power, it will disappear. I don't know what the different leaders tell him, but I will share with you what Ayin Bez has to say about this. The question is, how do you bridge these two worlds? How is it possible? And this is very relevant to all of us, to bring, drive the point home. You know, you all, you all woke up this morning, right? I know this as a scientific fact because you're all sitting here. So we must say that you must have woke up at some point. I'm talking about physically woke up. I don't know about spiritually. You know, some of us... Uh, can sleep with our eyes open too, you know. What about you? Okay, good. So we wake up in the morning. The question is, how excited are you when you jump, when you get up in the morning? Are you excited that a new day has come? Or are you just, you know, neutral? 
Or do you just resign yourself, listen, I have no choice because how long can you sleep? Or are you excited and you really say, wow, it's unbelievable. Well, that, that was the first option. Or the worst option is, I cannot stand that I woke up. I have a terrible day. I'd rather not have this life that I'm living. So you, have, you have to belong into one of these categories because you, know, you either love it, you hate it, you're neutral, whatever it is, from one to a hundred. I'm not going to go through the room, but just think yourself an imaginary number. From one, one being the, the minimum amount of excitement, and a hundred being you're absolutely excited about this new day. It, to rephrase the question a bit, the question is like this. How significant do you feel your life is? How important are your choices? How important are your moves that you're going to make? Does anyone care? We're one among seven billion people. It's a drop in a bucket. So what difference? You do this, you do that. We understand it may make a difference to you, to your small circle of friends. But in the big picture, what difference does it really make? And we go through our lives. Hopefully we live long and healthy lives. 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, 110, 120. I shouldn't have said 70. Let's start with 120. Everyone will live 120 healthy years. Or whatever the number will be. And the question is, what mark will you leave in this world? Will you leave a mark? Will anyone really care? Will anyone remember you in a hundred years from now? In five years from now? Now this isn't about an ego trip to be remembered. It's a question is, how significant are you? And how important are your choices? Does it really make a, does it make a difference? And if it doesn't make a difference, we all know that there are implications. You probably did not wake up with very big excitement if you don't think you make that much difference. And if you did, that would probably be direct, that would be the formula. If you did do feel that you're significant, then every day matters. Remember, if all of your life doesn't matter, obviously every day doesn't matter. If your life does matter, then every day matters, because every day is another contribution that you make. And this is, I would say, at the heart of most issues. Even though most of us, if, we were, if I was to ask you, what are your problems? What challenges do you face? Most of us would not talk about this. We would talk about, I'm having difficulty finding a relationship. I have issues with health. I have issues with parnasa, livelihood. I have my own psychological struggles. You know, we all have a list of things that we have difficulties with. The people we know, everyone's got their challenges. The question is, what is the root of all challenges? Is there a root? The answer is absolutely there's a root. That doesn't mean that the symptoms are not important. And it doesn't mean the symptoms don't, obviously, what we recognize are symptoms. When someone says, I have pain, they talk about the immediate pain. They don't talk about the root, where the pain is coming from. We may not even know where it's coming from. But I submit that the root of most issues is connected to this question of personal significance. Because this issue itself, when you have a challenge, and what you do about it, if it overwhelms you, Often that can be a sign because if you don't feel that your life is that significant and that important, so then one little wind comes, it blows you away. A tree that has deep roots and knows that it has purpose and has significance, so even though a storm may strike, it may be difficult at times, but you stand strong because you have something that's deeper than the challenges. So we all can get away for the time being with certain things if things are going smoothly. The question is, when there's a challenge, what happens to you? Does it completely throw you? Does it uproot you? And this has much to do with how we really understand our deeper lives. So though most of us don't think, let's say, a life of meaning or significance is the root of our issues, but I would say this, if you had that, it would preempt most, most issues. That doesn't mean life will become easy, but it means life has meaning, and then even suffering has meaning, and even challenges have meaning. Whereas if life has no meaning, then when there's suffering, you have nothing left. So, the real dilemma, and I'm broadening the question of the scouts, was really, you know, what role do we play in this type of world that we live in? And can we get anywhere? Can we even touch something that's significant? If we're at the end of the day we're mortals, and we will die, and we have our limited uh, tools, so what matter, what big, what, how much does it really matter at, at all? And in many ways the, the scouts said the same thing. Even though they said, let's stay in the spiritual environment, that's going to matter. But they also spoke about significance. Because one of the statements they made was the first time in, you know, we have the psychological expression called projection. Right? You project. That you project onto, onto others that which you feel about yourself. So you have it, the birth of projection is in this week's chapter as well. 
when the scouts come back, they say that we saw these giants and we appeared, we felt like we were small little insects. And that's how we appeared to them. They add that line. So everyone asks the question, what does that mean? Were they subjectively mid- small compared to these giants? So why are they saying, we felt like we were little insects, grasshoppers? If they actually were, let's say, five feet tall, six feet tall, and these giants were ten feet tall, so why they say we appear like that? They should have said, compared to them, we were giants. And here they said, no, we felt like we were insects, and that's how we appeared to them. Bottom line, this comes down to how you feel about yourself. You can be five feet tall and stand with a giant that's ten feet tall, but if you feel strong and confident, and you project confidence, then that person also sees you as strong and tall. And if you see yourself as weak, then obviously everyone else will see you as weak. That's what they were saying. It all began from themselves. So this was also part of it. We can't conquer this land. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. We don't have the confidence that we can enter and deal with these challenges. We know we can stay inside of yeshiva and akol and study Torah and do mitzvahs. And when we're protected, but send us out to a, a, an alien environment, a foreign environment that's antithetical to anything that is spiritual and divine, we don't have such strength. So this is also a lack of confidence that they were dealing with. And so that that applies to this question that I'm addressing, which is our own level of confidence and security. How secure and confident are we in, 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 within our, in, in ourselves? So I, and the question broadens in so many different ways that you can apply it to the challenges of our lives. And the interesting thing is that even though Moses understood the risks, he still sent these scouts. He sent these scouts because there was something in the land, there's something about this land that they had to discover, but conquering the land that is more profound than any spiritual journey. But the scouts failed. They failed in the process. And this is... On more spiritual terms, it's a similar thing what what every soul goes through when it comes to this world. Each of us here, believe it or not, we were once little children, right? Or maybe we're still little children, but we were even littler. And we once upon a time, we crawled around on all fours. And before that, we emerged from our mother's wombs, right? Just as I know you woke up, I know you emerged from your mother's wombs. And not because I'm a prophet, it's because that's the way the way of all flesh. And Velvel, our good friend here, just witnessed a new baby emerge into this world. Where did it come from? He has no idea. Came out of his mother, came out of his wife's womb, that's correct. But where did life come from? None of us know. It's from behind the curtain. Am I accurate in saying that? From behind the curtain, from another place. But we're told in the Torah some things about what goes on behind that curtain. When a soul is chosen by God, that at this point you're going to come down into a body. This means your soul and my soul. What, what, what does that soul go through? Be interesting to know, right? Get to know yourself a little. Remember, what we know about ourselves is very, very little. Most of what we know about ourselves, what, what, how far back do our memories go? Does anybody remember when they were three years old? We have faint memories at when three. You know, here a glimpse, there a glimpse. Unless there was some trauma. Most people don't remember when they were three. I have one or two images when I was three years old. Four, five, six. You start getting more memories, but they're also a bunch of fragments. You don't feel a flow. You know, you remember, oh, what class I was in, what teacher I had, you know, where did we travel? So our memories, as we go back to our beginnings of our lives, are very um, sporadic. You go back to your mother's womb, no one has a memory of that. Not, even as much as we try, we don't remember that. So it would be interesting to, let's say if your soul was interviewed, if you interviewed your soul and said, can you tell me something about what you went through before you came into me? What does it say? So actually the Talmud, the Medrash, and Kabbalistic texts talk about this. They talk about our souls, what our souls went through before they joined our bodies and were conceived and become first fertilized and then became, and then, be, then grew into a fetus and finally into a child, into a full-blown adult sitting here now in this room or wherever we may be in the world today. So there are many things that the soul can share with you if you asked it. 
One of the things to share, this all will share with you, is that I come from a very spiritual place. And I really didn't want to come into your body altogether. I didn't want to come to this earth. But I was commanded that I must come. The soul went through exactly what the scouts went through. It was in a world and environment, a very spiritual environment, where it didn't have anything material. No body, no health issues, no money issues, no issues of dieting and food and therapy and all the stuff that we struggle with. No jealousies, no pettiness, no uh, greed, no anger, none of that. No dysfunctionality. And then I was told that I'm being selected among millions of souls to go on a journey, to travel from a spiritual environment into a material world. And to tell you the truth, I was terrified when I heard this. I said, what does that world look like? I say, you don't want to know. And when I get a little glimpse of it, I didn't want to know. It was not very pleasant. I saw people fight about in, in, insignificant things, completely losing focus of what really matters, not being able to love properly, not being loved properly, living in a world full of enemies, full of duplicity and all of that. So you can imagine, I as a soul did not want to enter this world. But then, as the Mishnah says, I was commanded, al You must live. al I compel you. A command compelled me, coerced me, and said, you must go into this body, which I'm designating. Will, you'll be born into a family, and you're going to go through challenges. But I'm giving you, I'm giving you, must be and comes from the word, an oath, but also means masbia. I am sating you, I'm feeding you, nourishing you with all the strengths you will need to deal with any challenge in life. So the soul is given this whole series of strengths to face the new challenges it's going to encounter in a foreign world. The soul has no clue what this world is like. If you think you have no clue, your soul has even less clue. Because it's a spiritual entity. Why does it know about a material world? And left on its own, it would be like the scouts. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. I'm afraid, the soul says, to go into this world. I'll be consumed by it. People's selfishness, people's self-interest will completely lose focus of, of, of me as the soul of the focus of this world. The Bashantav gives this analogy to explain the, this, uh, this journey. He says, a king once as he was aging and ailing, wanted his son to inherit his throne, to be the heir to the throne. However, the son had grown up in the palace. He was spoiled. He was catered to. He was always protected. And the father of the king, as a wise king, realized that his son is not seasoned. He's too protected, too sheltered to really be a true sensitive leader. He was racking his brains. What do you do? He came up with an idea. As painful and difficult as it is for me, I will send my son away from the palace where he doesn't have ministers and nannies and protectors and assistants. He will, I'll send him off to a distant land in the kingdom where no one recognizes him. And I want him to earn his way. Let him learn the ways of the world on his own. Let him learn what it means to live from the bottom up and not privileged. And I'll make it, and he will go there. And as he learns the ways of the world and lives among the subjects, he'll develop the sensitivity, the empathy, to be a true, compassionate, and wise leader. But the father anticipates, knowing the king knows that once the son leaves, in the beginning it'll be painful. Then the son will slowly get accustomed, will assimilate to his environment, and will probably forget where he comes from. So the father says, you know what, I'm going to send my child a letter several times a year to remind him. Several times a year he's going to get a letter from me. Dear son, I am your father, the king. I sent you there for a mission. Don't forget where you come from. And they say, kachav, and that's what happens. The day comes, the faithful day comes, the father tells the son, time has come. My son, I have to send you away. I don't want to do so, but it's good for you, it's good for the people, it's good for the cause. And you'll learn to be a compassionate leader. And they cry, and they say goodbye. And of course it would defeat the purpose of the son, if the father sent along a whole group of uh, entourage. So he goes off into this foreign world. 
And as sad as it is, there's a deeper purpose. And, tr- and, and as promised, the father sends him a letter several times a year, reminding him. The son gets accustomed to his new world, becomes friendly with his neighbors, and slowly forgets that he is being groomed to be a king, a leader. But then he suddenly receives a letter from his father, and he's suddenly reminded. And as he thinks about it, he just wants to celebrate. Ah, now I know why I'm here. The problem is, who is he going to celebrate with? It's very difficult to celebrate on your own. All his friends, they won't appreciate it. They won't know what he's talking about. What are they going to tell them? That I'm the king, the future king. They'll either be resentful or they'll just think he's insane. So he comes up with a brilliant idea. He says, you know what? Today, I announced to the entire city that I'm, making, I'm throwing a party. Free cocktails on me. Everyone come and celebrate. He throws a party. Everybody celebrates. They're celebrating because they're getting free drinks. And he's celebrating because he received a letter from his father. And the Baal Shem Tov concludes, this is the analogy. What is the metaphor? The nimshal, what is the example? The example is, the king is God. The child is each one of us. Each one of our souls. And as long as the soul is in its palace, heavenly palace, it's protected. It's living in a spiritual environment. It has no challenges. It's very comfortable. It's in its comfort zone. Spiritual comfort zone. And the king says, I want you to accomplish something. I want you to transform the world. I want you to do something with your life, not just live in comfort, in my comforts, and bask in the glory of the divine. I want to send you to a world where no one recognizes you and you don't recognize yourself. And there, learn the ways of the world and learn how to elevate that world and turn it into a divine home. Take a wilderness a chaotic and cruel world and turn it into a garden, a beautiful garden. So God sends the soul down. They both cry. God cries. The soul cries. All the souls cry. And that's why a baby cries as soon as it comes out of its mother's womb. Some say it's to grasp the first breath of oxygen. And the mystics say it's because it's the last glimpse it has from where it's coming from and where it's going to. You also would cry if you saw the door close. And the soul enters into this world. And it does forget. We're told that this nine months in its mother's womb, it's a, a soul is taught the entire Torah. What does that mean? Well, it's taught the entire Torah. Today with sonograms, you can check inside a mother's womb. You're not going to find an angel with a candle and a chumash teaching Torah. So obviously it doesn't mean physically. It means psychologically. Just like the body physiologically develops during the nine months, the soul and the psyche develop and it's implanted, embedded within the soul is all the knowledge it will need to survive in this world. And then upon birth, the Talmud says, an angel comes and makes shh, like that, which is why we have a cleft. Mine is covered by my mustache, but we have a cleft right over our top lip. That's like the silence. And conscious minds are made to forget about what we just were taught. But our conscious minds retain that information. So we're made to forget. But then we receive a letter several times a year. These are holidays. Pesach, Shavuos, Sukkot, the other holidays. Shabbat. A letter comes from God to us. A divine message. The problem is, the soul wants to celebrate But with whom is it going to celebrate? The body doesn't appreciate spiritual messages. So the Torah says, you know what? On Shabbat Shabbat and holidays, call it a party. Give the body good food, kugel, kishke, chont, l'chaim. You know, make the body happy. Let it sleep a little extra. Socialize. The body is celebrating because it's getting free drinks. And meanwhile, the soul can celebrate because it received the message from above. Which answers two, incidentally, two big questions. Why Jews are so obsessed with food? What's this thing with food? What's so spiritual about food? You know, like they say, they wanted to kill us, we were saved, let's eat. You know, the Seder has food, Shabbat has its foods, Purim has hamantashen, Hanukkah, Latkes, Shvuz, Blintzes, you know, you name it. We've got this, this when it comes to food. 
What does food have to do with a spiritual divine journey? Because it's the food for the body to celebrate so it should participate and not distract the soul's journey. The second thing is most of us have forgotten the message. So we know only about the free cocktails. We've forgotten the real point of the holiday is the message, the divine message. This is the analogy the Baal Shem Tov gives. So you can imagine a soul is not interested in entering in this promised land. With all its great potential and its purpose, it prefers to stay in its spiritual environment. So we must go down. You must enter this world and you have the power to transform it. What was the, the scout's mistake? The mistake was they did not have the bitl. They lost their... Um, they were so consumed with their own view of spirituality, they lost their suspension of self to accept the fact that there's a higher purpose. The difference between Moses and the scouts, Moses was ma. Moses comes from the word, Moshe has the words ma, mem, hey in it. V'nachnu ma. Ma in Hebrew means what? You hear the word chokhma. Chokhma means wisdom. The spark of wisdom. You know when a flash of an idea comes into your mind, it's like you say, what? What was that? Where did it come from? There's a certain sense of of awe, a certain sense of surprise when we have a revelation, an epiphany. When you become too smart for your own good and you understand something, you lose that sense of, um, of free abandon. You lose that sense of, uh, of uh, spontaneity, the sense of, what do I want to say, the word I want to use. Um, that sense, that, that innocence that happens when we don't fully understand something, when we realize the mystery of it. The scouts were very smart people. They were brilliant people. And that was their undoing. They were too smart for their own good. And they forgot that there's more to just brains. Their brains told them, you know, this land is not for us. We can't, con- we can't conquer it. And they forgot they were sent there on a purpose. Their purpose was not to figure, not to question whether you can do it or not. The question is how you do it. And when someone becomes too smart for their own good, they lose that sense of ma. So as he explains here in Ayin Bays, when Moses sent them, he sent them telling them to check out three things. And each one he says the word ma. He says, check out three things. What, here I'll read to you the verse, it goes like this. He says to them, V'risa mesa aretz mahi. Check out the land, look at the land and see ma, what is it? Here he was referring to the people that lived in the land, the population, the citizens. Then he says the second is, Umah aretz, and see what kind of land it is, the physical land itself. And the third time he expresses it, he says, Check out the cities. What kind of cities? And all of them, he uses the word ma. So he explains, because the word, what they were supposed to do is look into this world and see how it can be transformed to fuel, to take matter and turn it into energy. Instead, they saw the matter as a threat and they ran back to their world of energy. What was lacking was the ma, was lacking the bitl, was lacking that dedication to something that's greater than they are. That was what was lacking. And to you, to, I'll explain in a moment in more mystical terms. But essentially, therefore, they, they allowed the dichotomy to manifest. It's a land that drives fear into us. You know, talking about recent events, for example, people wonder about the recent uh, city field gathering, about what to do about the Internet. Or the bigger question about modernity and faith. What should we do with the modern world? So the scouts would say, as scholars and as spiritualists, they would say it's too powerful for us. It's too powerful. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. On the other hand, the fact of the matter is just to embrace it all without any disciplines, obviously is also not an objective. How do you, how do you uh, engage with a modern world and still retain your spiritual connection? There's only one way. Ma, bittal. If you're dedicated to a higher purpose cause than yourself, that gives you the ability to, over, to overcome any challenge. If it's about your own calculations, and your own calculations, you'll say, you know what? This may not work. So you either have the extreme of people just escaping into a spiritual oasis, insulating themselves, or you have people who just resign themselves and give up and let the world consume them. It is a world, that, a land that consumes its inhabitants. The way you... Avoid that is when you're tied above, you don't fall below. 
That's the key. Which means the following. The soul has real reason to be afraid of entering this world. That's not an illusion. The world is a difficult world. Look at the world. It is a land that consumes its inhabitants. Is there somebody that's not for sale? Is there somebody that doesn't get compromised by the challenges, by peer pressure, by marketplace pressures and so on? So the soul has a very good argument. The scouts had a very good argument. What's the response? The response is there's a God that's sending you. And I'm giving you, and he's telling you you have the power to do it. So the answer is yes, you have to engage. But always remember there are fears, there are concerns. The only solution is that you have to hold on very strong to, to, your, to a lifeline. It would be like sending somebody underwater. You say, I don't want to go underwater, it's very dangerous there. But we're sending you with a lifeline. You're a diver. You have a pipe that goes up and connects you to the, hold on for your dear life to that pipe and you'll be all, you'll be all right. There's an expression Chassidim say, when you're tied above, you don't fall below. It refers to a story that when one, two young Chassidim once came to a town, it was a freezing Russian city. Friday afternoon, they were asking, where's their ritual bath, a mikvah? They want to go to a mikvah before Shabbos. And they said, there's one, but nobody goes to it in the winter because it's by the bottom of a hill, which is very slippery, covered in ice throughout the winter. Said so nobody in the entire city goes. They said, yes, there's one elderly chassid goes. No one knows how he makes it, but he goes. They were skeptics. They couldn't believe it, so they decided they'll follow him. They follow him, yep. Yeah. And they see. He's able to make it down the mountain without an issue. They try to follow him. This one fell and broke his hand. This one broke his arm, leg. They meet him shul and Shabbos, and they say, we don't understand. Such slippery slopes, no one was able to maneuver. How would you, an elderly Jew, an elderly man able to do it. So his response was, that when you're tied above, you don't fall below. What does this mean? How did that actually physically help him? Clearly, when you have connections and you're stronger, like you have a rope that you're connected to, you can go into a very deep pit. You don't have a rope, you're going to be lost. And the Blazhina Rebbe was one of the Holocaust survivors. And he was in a particular camp, together with, he had a philosopher who knew him, and they were both in this camp, and there was a Nazi captain, a Nazi commander, who was a particularly vicious, they were all vicious, but he was had his own particular sadism, and he loved to play this game with the Jews, he would have them dig wide trenches, and tell them, whoever jumps over this trench, lives. If you can't jump over the trench, you'll be shot on the spot. So this philosopher says to the Rebbe, Rebbe, you know, enough is enough, besides being killed, Look, they're humiliating us. Let's just give up. Let's not play along the game with him. And let him shoot us all and that's it. Let's end it with dignity. And the Rebbe said, no, as long as we have the power, we have to try to live. We don't know God's plan. Okay. So the game started. The Jews lined up. They dug the trench. Obviously, most of the Jews couldn't make it, especially the elderly. The few that made it lived for another day. What happened to these two? Well, no one knew. They didn't know. Till after the war, they both survived. And they had the reunion. And the, the, the chassid, the philosopher, the thinker says to the rabbi, he, said, how, he says, how did you make it? You're not a young man. How did you jump over that trench? He said, I closed my eyes. And I held on to the coattails of my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather. And it gave me the strength to jump. And he turned to the younger, the philosopher, and he says, and what about you? How did you make it? He says, I held on to your coattails. So obviously this is metaphorical, but it's not more than metaphorical. You see, for example, God forbid, someone's in a hospital, sick. Look, a study in contrast. One person has visitors, and one person has no visitors. One person has people coming, praying for him or her, caring, encouraging Today we know there's a medical difference. It's not just nice a nicety or not. When you have hope, and you have people around you giving you hope, it strengthens your immune system, gets your adrenaline going, and, it's, and it gives you the ability to heal better. Obviously there's no magic formula. But it definitely is a, a, help, a, a healing agent. A person who's lying in bed alone, no one visits. You can imagine, they get resigned, they weaken, and that itself weakens their whole, all their systems. So there's a way of being connected to something that gives you strength. When you know someone cares, someone's calling you up, you're not just going to sleep alone, or no one really cares. There's someone that cares. It can give you strength. 
Because at times when you may want to give up, you don't give up because that other person believes in you. So the idea of being tied above means that you're getting strength from a greater place. All those that have endured challenges, guaranteed, it always comes down to the same algorithm. They had a connection to something greater than themselves. The Jewish people are here today because they never forgot that connection. We always knew that we're here because there were those before us, and before us, those before us. And they knew that even if they die, they will have the next generation, and we have to pass on the baton. And anyone who's running a marathon and knows that every generation is another leg of the marathon has power, not just your own power, you have the cumulative power of all those that ran the marathon before us. That's what we have. No other nation in the world has that. You know, Americans, most of them don't even know where they originate from. Yeah, we know generally from Ireland, from Germany, from here, from there. But where exactly, who can you trace what your great-great-grandparents? Once in a while. We speak about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. We speak about lineage. There are people who know exactly the generations. And most of us know approximately. Because our parents and grandparents knew that the key thing was not just to be a philosopher, but to build a family. Abraham implanted that method, and it's always been the case. So we have all the family rituals. You have a bris, you have a bar mitzvah, a bat mitzvah, you have a seder. Everything is focused on making sure that the tradition is passed on. So besides all the deeper mystical meaning behind it all, there's a power to that. That connects us. We say yisker for those that passed on. We remember them. We light a, a, a candle. Look how many hospitals and, and, and institutions are named for Jewish Completely disproportionate. You have hospitals, Beth, Israel, and so on, so Because Jews always not manu, build something in the name of those that came before us. Others have learned this message as well, but Jews always knew it from the beginning of time. So there's a thing being connected above, and the ten scouts, they were brilliant, but they lost the connection for a moment. Kolov and Joshua and Yeshua did not. It says about Yeshua, his name was Hesheya, to Yeshua, because Moses prayed for him, that God should protect you. And Kolov, what's the first thing he did when he entered Israel? He went to Hebron. He went to the Ma'aras HaMachpelah. He went to the grave of the patriarchs to connect to them, to connect to those that came before us. And that's what gave them the strength. That's why they were able to not be completely overwhelmed as this gospel. They saw the same thing. They also saw the giants. They also saw a land that consumes its inhabitants. But they never lost their connection. And that's what gave them the power. So it's not like they saw a different world, they were delusional, and say, no, it's not such a powerful world. The soul can see this world in a very, and see all its difficulties. But the soul that remains connected can make it through, and the one that loses that connection cannot. And that was the ma. That's what Moses said, the ma. Remember the ma. Remember the bitl. Remember that you have to be connected to something greater than you. Because when you go into the pit, the deeper you go, the, the longer the rope you need, and you better hold on to it for your dear, your dear life, because that's where you need it most. Don't get cocky and overconfident. And that's what the scouts happened to them. So what does this mean on a, let's talk about it let's, a little more on a, um, on a more mystical level. So I'll share with you a thought from Ayan Bez, and tell me if this is over your heads or not. In the mystical worlds, in the spiritual worlds, everything I just discussed has a root. You know, when you want to understand something on a, a, an ostensible level, you want to see how it is in the engineering room. What is this whole dilemma that I just described and the resolution on the on the root level? So the I am based in this section where he talks in this hundred years ago this week, he talks about the idea of the structure of existence. What is the structure of existence? So it's based on, based on what we usually call energy and matter, or what he calls energy and containers. Iris and Kalin. Everything in this world consists of an energy and a container. Everything. Let's start with ourselves. There's a body, it's the container. And the soul is the energy. Your eyeball, your ear, your mouth, your heart, your brain, your arms, your legs. These are containers. Each one has commensurate to it, proportionate to it, an energy that enters from the soul. That makes it come alive. Your eyes can see, your ears hear, your arms move about, can write, your legs walk, your heart beats, your brain thinks. 
conceives. And every energy is tailored to its container. This is a central theme. So really everything is that. The same is true as a book. What is a book? Letters that compose words, that compose sentences, that compose paragraphs, that compose pages and chapters, till you have a volume. When you read the letters, the letters are the containers. But the message within them, the idea they convey, that's the energy. You ever read a book, a good book, and you're immersed in it, you get completely absorbed in it. You don't even notice the letters and the words. Because you're so consumed, you're like reading the story. Then you stop a second, a second, one second, hey, these are letters, these are words. You can just turn pages and not even know you turn pages. Because the energy is flowing so seamlessly through the words. That's when a good writer gets our attention. That the containers are almost invisible, even though they're absolutely there. Take them away, you can't read. You won't know what the author's intentions. You listen to music. You unplug, you cover your ears with headset. Music is made up of notes, of chords, of variations. And yet when you hear music, you get consumed with energy. But it's made of, made up of containers, made up of actual sounds. So everything in this world has containers and energies. Now, we being initially superficial human beings, and we get caught up with, with the externals, we focus on containers all the time. That's what we see. We see the containers. You see a table. You don't really know what energy it has. Except, okay, this is a table. I could put a book on it. I could sit down and have a meal at this table. Letters, as I said, can convey ideas. But most of our lives, when you walk down the street, you're, fo you're completely focused on the containers. That's We're sensory human beings, and our senses get stimulated. You see this. You see colors. That's the power of advertising. Here, we got a good picture right across the street. What is that an ad for? Those guys in the, in the yellow shirts. What is that an ad for? Does it say? Hmm? So, what? Clothing store. Just a clothing store. Okay. So look at it. It's, meant, it's built and engineered to get your attention. You see the lighting on it, the yellow. You know, so it stands out for everything. Why? Because I want you to look at it and get you inside there. You like those people, they look cool, they look young, they look vibrant. You want to look like them, so it gets you there. Perfect example. How many such images have affected you today? You, you don't even know how many. That's how they much they affect us. That's why advertising works. Even though I know, I mean, I was younger, I used to think advertising works on everyone but me. Then I realized that everybody thinks that, and, and that just proves that it works on everybody, and everybody doesn't think it affects them. Then you get to a point you know it affects you very, very clearly. And I don't mean advertising that actually you go and buy something. I'm talking about advertising you think has not impact on you. How many of you drink Coca-Cola? Okay. What is, with, with that, why do you drink Coca-Cola? Because they got you when you're young that this is like the, uh, the fizz, the, the drink, and so on. If it was just seen as a brown water, rusty brown water with a little gas in it, most people wouldn't very be excited about that. But they got you. They, they brainwashed us into thinking it's necessary. You can't have a hot dog without a Coke. You can't go to a baseball game without a Coke. You know. And then they comes holiday seasons and Coke is all red and all that. And I'm not knocking Coke. I'm just using it as an example. Trust me, they're big enough. They can take a little abuse. Um, the point I'm making here is that we are consumed with images, with externals. It's all containers. And someone says, what's the energy behind that? Well, the energy behind it is, the, is a marketing machine that wants you to come in there to buy clothing. But we're not energy-focused people. But in the last century, because of technology, we've become more energy-sensitive. Because we see our gadgets, our computers, our mobile devices, our communication tools. What's lacking, however, is the energy human beings. When you meet somebody, who are you speaking to? To their body or to their soul? If you're talking about a man and a woman, usually it's a body-oriented thing. You know, we're attracted to each other. And there's the natural flirtation that takes place. I don't mean necessarily even in any unhealthy way. Because we are people that, look, that live in a visual world and we live on a container level. When you speak to somebody, do you feel they really care about your welfare, about your soul, about your soul's journey? Well, real soul doctors, when you speak to them, that's all they see is your soul. 
which happens to be in a particular container called your body. It's like reading a book. The letters are just a, a, a medium. To the point when you really read the book properly, you're reading the ideas. The, the letters are almost imp- uh, invisible. When's the last time you had a conversation with someone that looked, like, looked at you that way? They saw you as a book, not as a bunch of letters. They looked at you as an idea, as a, as a spirit, as a, a, traveling through a body. You need to have soulful people to see things that way. I am Bayes, in its long and relentless way, tries to retrain us to think on an energy level instead of a container level. This doesn't happen overnight. Because we're so brainwashed and we're so programmed to think container-wise, we don't think energy-wise. We look at a problem, we think in terms of what can I do right now short-term to correct it. A soulful person looks at the roots, not at the symptoms. A soulful person always looks at the bigger picture, looks at what is the purpose of your life, not just what is your function. We are, as I said earlier, a, a, a combination of many fragments because we are a bunch of containers going on. One container is called your bed. One container is called your kitchen. Another one's called your commute, your workplace, your coffee place, your restaurant, the, the movies, the films, the shows, the places you travel to, a bunch of containers. Containers, by definition, are like a lot of letters scattered all over the world. Imagine someone can come and take those letters and unjumble them and say, here's your story. It's a bunch of words. It's not just words, it's chapters. It's a story. All your life is not fragments. They're all pieces of a, a bigger picture. That's called energy perspective. Energy thinking, soul thinking. And then there's body thinking, thinking on the container level. So this is the theme that's running through Ayin Bez, especially in its early chapters. And in this particular discourse, and I'm looking at it right now, he talks about how this energy evolves. How does the energy or the soul enter into these containers? And he speaks about, number one, that it all originates in a very amorphous place. Remember, when an artist or an author or a musician, a composer, conceives of an idea, before they actually put it in a book, there are no letters at all. First you conceive of a vision. Then that vision manifests into specifics, which will end up becoming letters and words and phrases and ideas that will convey that vision. For an artist, it will be a palette with colors and a canvas. For an author, it will be a pen or a word, or, or a, uh, word processor, letters and words. For a musician, a composer will be musical notes and instruments. These are all containers they use, but they're all, cont- they're all containing and expressing a vision. A vision is not definable. The soul is a vision. The vision of your life is your soul. But visions in this world are not uh, containable. The vision has to enter into container. And that's what means that energy enters into container. Energy, by definition, is also transcendence. Vision is transcendent. Containers are not. Containers are grounding. So the letters of the page allow us to communicate it to someone else. But it's the ideas that allow you to transcend the letters and reach a greater place. So in a way, you can say musical notes or any of these containers are really structure that allows us to transcend structure. But you need a structure in this world. There's no way for us to communicate if we don't use words and letters and so on. So in this particular discourse on Shlach, 100 years ago, the Rebbe Rashab talks about how this evolution takes place, how the energies from a vision level end up manifesting inside the containers. And here's the story. Moses recognized and was able to combine the vision and the containers. and And the scouts were unable to. They got stuck on the vision level and they were unable to really connect it to containers and they became afraid of the containers. They said, we want to stay on the vision level. We don't have patience and ability to enter. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. It would be the equivalent of an author or an artist saying, if I try to put it down into words, it will lose its integrity. So I have to remain in my mind. The challenge is, can you actually communicate it in a defined way and still retain that integrity? That's the best writers, the best musicians and composers are able to communicate through a language that speaks to us and they can lift you to a place that's transcendent, even though they're using non-transcendent tools called containers. So you see the story of life really plays itself out if you think about it on this energy and container level. 
And then it manifests in our personal lives, as I described. Containers would be the things we do all the time. The functions. And energy is the purpose, the vision. Unfortunately, most of our lives are driven by functions. Maybe we're functional human beings, but usually devoid of real purpose. The purpose is the immediate purpose. I go to work in order to make money so I can buy things that I think are important to me. That's very container-based language. A soul would say, I go to work to make money in order to buy things that help me spiritualize the world in which I live. It's a whole different response. It means that, and means, and also when I go to work, there are sparks there for me to redeem. Wherever I go, I find opportunities that help me um, fulfill the purpose for which I was sent to this earth. It's basically purpose-driven life. It's a meaningful life instead of one driven by the moment. So it doesn't mean that you can't have special moments and that you can't have meaningful moments, but they're all fragments. Whereas a person who wakes up in the morning and realizes, I'm a soul, that my soul just returned to me, is a person who's thinking, okay, if my soul just returned to me, what is the vision that my soul is communicating to me? How many people ask that question even? That's a, that's a purpose, person who feels he's on a mission all the time. Imagine an astronaut is sent out to outer space. And a mission that would be over years. And you know, like you have all these science fiction movies today, where because the journey is so long, the astronauts are put to sleep. They go into this, uh, whatever, hibernation. And they wake up 10 years later. They wake up 10 years later. They're 10 years older. And they turn on the computer, whether it's HAL or whatever computer it is. And the computer tells them, here's your mission. You're now 10 years out of space. The previous generation perhaps even died. And now here's your mission. If that astronaut for one moment forgets their mission, they're dead. If he doesn't follow the protocol and instructions, he's dead because he's in outer space. Well, how he eats, how he sleeps, whether he wears a, whether he wears a helmet or not, it's all dependent because he's in a very precarious environment. There's no oxygen. Everything is calculated. Do we see ourselves in this world that way? Absolutely not, because we don't feel we're on a mission. Pop, we wake up one morning. What am I going to do today? Let's see. If you have work and something else, if you have something on your calendar, great. And if not, eh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do today. We have no direction, no guidance, and definitely no sense of mission. So there's no sense of urgency. The Torah teaches us that you, you were sent here like an astronaut was sent to outer space. You're sent here like the child sent by the king to a foreign world in order for you to change your world. And every second you're on this mission. It's not just a mission when it's convenient and when you're bored or like on weekends or, you know, once in a while, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. This is a mission 24-7, the entire life. Every second that you breathe, you're here for a reason. And if you're, and if you're still here, it means that your contract was renewed just this second again. If you wake up in the morning, and God should bless everyone waking up healthy, it means you need it for another day. And the question is, do you know this? Do you think this way? Just to show you, I'm not trying to make anyone feel better, just to show you how far we are from thinking this way. We don't think this way at all. You know, it's like for some people, when I say this, many people will will be skeptical and say, who says that's true? Who told you this? The reason we say that is because it's so foreign to us, we don't really relate it. But think about it for a few days. You tell me if it makes sense or not. Because the other alternative is that you're, there's no mission at all. Then, yeah, do what you like. But then, as I said before, how far are you going to go with that? The idea of, of, of accepting a mission is like that rope that I mentioned. You're tied above. You were sent here. If you were sent here, you were given all the faculties and resources necessary to do what you have to do. And that is the essence of the message of Torah, and that's the essence of what the scouts were sent, but they lost sight of it. They didn't lose sight of their mission, but they lost sight of what the purpose of of it was, which was to figure out how to enter this land. And they got consumed with the ten hidden spheres, as he puts it, forgetting that you have to enter into containers, and you have to refine them, you have to elevate them. I just wanted to just read to you a line, if I may, straight from uh, from this discourse. So it says like this. One 
second. Well, actually, we translate it, but I'll translate it again. The scouts did not have, he says, they did not have this subjugation and dedication to the cause. And that's why they let out this gossip about the land. They basically slandered the land. It's called Dibus Haaretz. And Moses' intention by sending them was, was that they should have the bittel and that they should infuse that bittel into the land and therefore be able to elevate it. Which really means entering into the world of containers and elevating it instead of being afraid of it. So you really have three options. You have one option as the scouts opted for, just to avoid the containers altogether, remain on the vision level. You have the other option to enter the containers and get trapped there and forget about the mission altogether. And you have option three is the perfect balance, to enter, but always know that there's a purpose of why you're there. And that's the, the, the objective of all of our lives. So when you think about it, the scout story of the scout is really our own story. Everyone else, every one of us has, deals with this dilemma one way or another. How do you engage with the world and still remain above water? How do you still remain with integrity? So I'll tell you one little secret, as I said before, with the astronauts. You're either in control or the world will control you. There's no third option. You're either influence, you're either on the offense and you're influencing, or you'll be influenced. There's no other option. So I look at this uh, image out there, and I say to myself, okay, uh, am I going to go into that store tomorrow? You know, yes, if I'm, interest, if I'm interested in it influencing me, that's exactly what I would do. But I look at it, you know what I think? I said, how could I emulate that and maybe make an advertisement for IM Bays to get people to come visit imbays.com and study some Hasidus tomorrow? That's what I learned from that. So the question is, you know, who's the master, who's the slave? If you look at it that way, then we, you walk down the street, everything you see, even the things that distract you, if you look at it as another f- fuel for a higher purpose, then even the things that they, they want to influence you, you could end up using to influence it, so to speak. So it comes down to who is in control. Now it depends how you think, what kind of mindset you have. The mindset of a Torah mindset is that wherever you go, it's an opportunity for you in some way to elevate it, turn it into a spiritual energy. The other mindset is, wherever you go, what happens, happens. And sometimes I'll, I, I'll, I'll feel good, sometimes I won't feel good, and sometimes I'll feel overwhelmed. You come into an environment, there's always an opportunity for you. This itself, having this attitude, means build confidence. It builds the strength. So you meet a giant, the scouts, what did they see? They suddenly saw, them, they saw themselves as small little entities. So that's how the giants saw them as well. When you're a giant in your own heart, doesn't matter how tall you are. You see a big giant, you say, hey, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. You know? Um, the big things, you can learn things from that too. Everything has messages. I look at Coca-Cola and I learn a lot of messages. How can we create a spiritual brand that overtakes Coca-Cola that everyone on this earth knows about? That's how I see it. So I see Coca-Cola as our competition, basically, right? The Meaningful Life competition. So we're shooting for the top, as you can tell. What do you think? So, huh? Should we start with Pepsi? No, why not? Might as well go for Coca-Cola. They say, other man for the class, right? They say, a poor person, a poor person travels first class. You know, if you're already going for it, you might as well go all the way from the top. The point I'm trying to make is that mysticism, Hasidus, teaches us to be spiritual opportunists. Wherever we go, there's opportunity. There's a Facebook, there's an internet, there's technologies, it's opportunities to bring a message out there. And when you feel that way, then, then that becomes your instrument instead of you being its instrument. So next time you're, you're using a mobile, next time you use some other technology, think who's the master and who's the slave. That's the key. So, the Meraglim said that Kalim, E.F. Shalahetzias Kalov. God could not free himself from these containers. That's the word they used. Because this world is too powerful. They basically said, you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to run into the Holy of Holies on top of a mountain, into a synagogue. No way you could enter this, the Kalin level, the containers. He actually says that God cannot free himself from these containers that he created, which God forbid is the, great, the, the, ultimate, the, 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 the ultimate crime, challenging God's telling you, you can enter this world and you can change it, and it won't change you. So we have many, many messages, and I hope 
I had list to outline some of them that we can apply into different algorithms and different formulas that we can apply to our lives. And again, for me, the goal is to take these ideas and I am based in Chassidus in general, things I teach here Wednesday night, and and hopefully collaborate with yourselves or people of different schools of thought, whatever school of it, and try to create parallel, define parallels, and as I said, develop uh, models, modalities that can actually help us in this journey called life. And as that, and, and as such. Each of us is a sacred component in this journey. Each of us is indispensable musical note. And instead of being just a bunch of letters that are scattered and fragmented or musical notes, the truth is we're all part of one larger song. But in the case of musical notes, musical notes don't have free will. So however the composer puts them on the page, that's how they stay. We do. So we can be musical notes and decide not to play the music or not to join other musical notes. So our challenge is how do we join together and willingly choose to play the music together. So that's how I feel is part of my mission, mission of the Meaningful Life Center. And this is part of what we do, including these classes that we have online and live, including this new I Am Bayes venture and more to come. And I invite you all to participate and partner and collaborate in every possible way. Everyone listening to this and all of you sitting here. And please share it with your friends. We go on every Wednesday night. I believe next Wednesday night we'll be back on a regular location. Am I correct, Alvo? I assume. Okay. Philip will be giving his class tomorrow night. Yes. Okay. And um, as always, if you have, don't, have not given us your email address, please do so. We've also initiated and f- f- launched Club 72, I Am Bays, which is really, at this point, a weekly email that's going out free. But it's... A summary of these discourses. It's pretty fascinating stuff, so you could sign up for that. That's a free subscription. And uh, and more to come. Uh, um, some surprises as well. So we have to make you, uh, we have to leave something, uh, something wanting, right, as well. And as I always say, it's a great honor to intersect and to uh, participate with you in this glorious journey. And starting tonight and tomorrow morning, know that you're sent here on a mission. You're not just a floating uh, soul, but you have something to accomplish with your life. And if you're not sure yourself, just rest assured, I completely believe in you. And uh, please see me as a friend and uh, support as well as Velvo in helping us all build that confidence and uh, that strength that we are all part of this uh, journey and it can't be done without you. So thank you very much.